Letters of Freedom was like a novella that I wrote. Yes. And you include examples of it. In and your I book. was just writing yes. Letters to Freedom. Give us an example. Can you? Like I wrote Freedom was my girlfriend. Yeah. So I wrote Letters to Freedom about the advancement, how she changed, how she lived life different. Yeah. How she more spinner, experimental and just doing her. And, and I was like basically telling her like, I miss you. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can't wait to, you know, experience all the things you learned since I've been gone. Yeah. And when I'm talking about the experience and things you learned since I was born, I was talking about the growth in women out here. Mm. Like how they, you know, how they, you know, it, and it was like, I used to just write letters to her. Today we have Wallace Wallow 267 Peoples on the show. Wallow 267 is an activist, cultural change maker, speech maker, philanthropist, podcaster, and social media influencer. After serving 20 years in prison, he has made it his mission to show the world that there are no straight lines to success or healing. He uses his life experiences and various platforms to inspire people to overcome their challenges and commit to transforming their lives day by day. In this episode, we cover Wallow 267's early life, his current mission, and his impact on young people and the hip-hop community. So without further ado, I bring you Wallow 267. Wallace Wallow 267 Peoples. Yes. Welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Yes, I'm here. I'm, I'm glad to be here. So good to have you here. You are so many things, right? You wear a lot of hats. Yeah, at least some people say that. Yeah. On, well, on your website, <laughs> I see a whole bunch of hats. Um, you're activist, cultural change maker, speech maker, philanthropist, podcaster, social media influencer. Now, you weren't always all these things. No, no, no. And it took a lot of, a lot of work to get there. A lot of work. Yeah. So why don't you tell me what February 18th, 2017 felt like to you? It was a scary ass day because, you know, I'm walking out of prison and for the first time I got to be somebody that I never was. I got to be a a law abiding citizen. Uh, But not just that. I told my grandma, my family members and anything that I was a different person and I had changed when I was incarcerated. But I never, that change has never been challenged yet to see if it's really changed. Mm. So I'm scared as shit coming home from jail. I think that's the scariest day coming home from prison. That's the most scariest day because you got to be somebody you never was. And it's just like, it's the unknown, like never before, you know? Yeah, but you were happy you got McDonald's. Yeah, I got that grub. I got the little breakfast sandwich. I was cool. Yeah, uh, and, and it's I a little thing. And I stopped in a uh, well, I think well, stopped somewhere. Got some razors because they had like one blade razors in jail, and they like mm-hmm. they like you got to keep using it to the next. It's just bullet. So I stopped, got some, and I was just happy seeing just seeing little things, you know, on the ride to home. Yeah. Well, you know, there's so much of this new book you wrote goes through the, your childhood and the things that you went through and mm-hmm. the things you felt compelled to do, right? Um, and, uh, there are a lot of these kind of stories you talk about where you, uh, were attempting robbery, right? It wasn't always armed robbery. No, not always. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So it kind of, you worked up like no one's born, you know, like doing things, right? Like, you know, there's a lot of series of steps and stages and can you kind of, it's kinda always, see it? yeah. yeah. You just keep evolving and in that whatever world you in. I am a huge hip hop fan. I used to be a professional break dancer. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and I just, I, I like in, in grad school, I watched BET every day of my life. You, so if you was, at, you, you watched B street before, right? Yes. So this was Breaking, back. Yeah. Fresh groove. Yeah. T- Tigger. <laughs> this is back in like, um, 2006, 2006. So like every day and like none that of was my late, friends. That was late in the game though. I know. I know, but I'm just ready to go back to the eighties. Better late than never. I wasn't eighties. Yeah. No, yeah. no, but like, you know, this is like, I couldn't like resonate like at Yale, like no one was like, would talk saying. to me about it. Yeah. <laughs> and like every day I was watching this. So anyway, I'm a big hip hop fan. So that's one thing. And you have done a lot for the hip hop community and you have a podcast, you know, on this topic, but it's really interesting. Kind of like you can, can you see your whole life there kind of in front of your eyes right now, kind of all these these steps that led up to things that has made you a role model now. But in a lot of ways, would you, do you even regret those things? I mean, there's one sense you regret them, but there's another sense I regret you, the thing, you, you know, victimizing my victims, you know, it's victims of crimes. So, you know, you got to regret that, but like anything else, it's like, 
you live and you, you know a lot of your hardships and a lot of your experience and uh, journey get you to where you are now you know mm-hmm. and even as things you know you just you just don't know because you're growing up and you're trying to figure life out you, you you're taking all these l's these losses mm-hmm. not knowing the lessons for later you know so it was like it was a lot man i don't you know and it's like i don't can't take back if you, if any if any of us take a lot of this stuff back we ain't gonna be where we at today that's the thing like you wouldn't no be this change maker yeah. it's kind of fascinating how life works like that you don't see you only see it in reverse right mm-hmm. but i mean imagine if you did you know you didn't enter the life of crime whatsoever in your early childhood let's say you had just you let's say you lived i, I don't know what the word to use like boring <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I'm trying to think of like a boring uh, childhood, you know, like you probably would not be as motivated to do what you're doing yeah. today. I don't know. I don't know where I would be. Who, where would you? Yeah. You never know. You, you, you don't know. We could figure out. We could hope and wish and yeah. wish it could have been, would have been. But, you know, you just don't know. You don't know. You know, you don't know. You said I want to I'm going to quote you a lot today. Um, you say I make it my life's work to show the world that there's no straight line to success or healing. And that's why writing this book is so important to me. I want to inspire others to overcome their challenges by sharing through my experience, the commitment and sacrifices it takes to transform your life day by day completely. So do you go around? You give do you give talks to uh, like inner city? Yeah, I do that in the cities, the juvenile facilities. And just regular people that I just went into, you know. Yeah. And I just try to share share with them the best knowledge that I have of overcoming hardships and getting out of that funk, you know what I mean, and understanding that the world is bigger than the environment that produce you, an environment you might spend most of the time in. So, you know, but it's different walks of people mm. from different nationalities, different genders. So, you know, it all depends on who I'm talking to at the moment, you know, but I just think that everybody needs a little push. Yeah, so what do you do when a, a young kid – comes up to you and you're like kind of seeing a younger version of yourself and let's say he's like chosen a life of crime let's say whatever it is you know i talk what to him say? straight i let him know yeah. i let him, and i and i you know i be straight to him in a way it wasn't always straight to me i give it straight like listen man you're going to jail or somebody gonna kill you yeah like you you got to be realistic with him especially because right now it's in real time what's going on with him and at any moment you know they could just be in a different place I mean, so, you know, you got to give it to him right in there. Bang, here it is. This is what it is, you know. So for our listeners that aren't aware, um, so what what got you into jail? Like what was the Two armed robberies, two okay. firearm violations. But I've been in jail before that. That's what got me to Larson's. But I've been in jail most of my life. June 30th, centers. 1990, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I first got arrested, I was 11 for a couple of days and a few days and uh, for, armor, for, for robbery. And I went on. Spent five years juvenile facility. Went from there, seventeen. Caught the big cases. Got certified as an adult. They sent me to the penitentiary, twenty years. So you know, it's like it just was about my life. It was the life that I was living, you know. And you just kept escalating. Oh yeah, it always do. Yeah. You know, crime is like you always get. You find new ways. You, you try to make it quicker. It's, just, it's always going to be a way that you're going to find. You said something. There's a quote uh, that uh, really gave me a pause. And I was like, huh, that's so interesting. You said, this life of crime wasn't the life I wanted, but it was all I knew. Yeah. Why was it all you knew? Because it was like, it's like, it was the education of the street culture. Hmm. And I seen that in America, they respected successful criminal. More than anybody. Hmm. Like a lot of people just, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, why? Oh, why this? So I'm looking at it as a kid. And I'm like, anytime the drug dealer pull up in that Mercedes Benz with diamonds on his pinky rings and a nice clothes on, coming to get the most beautiful girl in the neighborhood and everybody speak to him. They don't speak to the guy that come home from work looking at the janitor, what's his name? And, and then on top of that, you can ask any judge, any United States attorney, district attorney, FBI agent, CIA agent, DEA agent. What's your five favorite movies? Mm. All of them go ahead. Good, for, good, good guy, five and Scarface in them. They love Scar. They love the, they love Michael Coulion. They love Tony Soprano. So there's something about like the uh, seductive appeal of power that really drives a lot of it. It, 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 it it's something about the idea of wrong. I think wrong is like 
wrong is like worship more than anything out here. Yeah, we fetishize it. Wrong is yeah. powerful. Yeah. So, so when you're looking at wrong, you're looking at it like, I gotta have some some sort of wrong in my life. Yeah. Um, and people, even if it's I work out, but I'm a cheat with this food. Mm-hmm. Even if it's different sexual acts. Even if it's oh, this is a lie, but it's a white lie. Even if it's a yeah, it's always something that weirds though. It's people have a craving for it somewhere in their life, but sometimes the movies, the music, uh, but you get to everybody in some way. They love the successful criminal. They love the bad guy. I hope he get away. Well, you know, a lot of this kind of motivation for power often comes from when someone's in a state where they feel powerless. So I'd love to know more about your state of mind at that time. Did you feel, you said this was the only way you knew. So were you feeling like, like a uh, lack of control at the time? No, it wasn't lack of control. It was just that I wanted to steal an American dream hmm. because I didn't think anybody that really had anything substantial work for it. Hmm. I never, I never seen a person that worked for 20 years with a Mercedes Benz. Mm. Like that's one in a million. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You you like you got to work on Wall Street or some shit like that. And how many of them ain't stealing? So you so I'm sitting there looking like, damn, I ain't seen nobody do it right. When? Mm. And it's at a young age. I'm peeping this, and I'm like, hold up. How she? How how he worked all them years and in his fifties ain't got nothing. But this guy is twenty something, figured it out in sixteen months and living the life. Mm. Do you think a lot of that comes down like to the role models that are available to you, like in your immediate community? Yeah, I, you know, it was some, but they was outnumbered. Mm. No, that's what it sounds like. They, listen, yeah. you got to understand it. They was outnumbered by the marketing of wrong. Mm. Right, right. The marketing of wrong, the box office movies, and when it come out, the movie, everybody's saying that everybody know about these movies and these. You know what I mean? It's like you know when you look at um. You look at Goodfellas, and it, I think it was Ray Liotta, mm. and he had the the one part of Goodfellas. If you mm. go back, you a movie buff. We gonna see. You go back, and it was a time when he was a little kid, and, and he went in there to blow the cards up. And he said, "By the time I was fourteen, I was making more money than all the grown ups in my neighborhood." Mm. So when you look at that, it's like, phew. well, it's very seductive. Yeah. Yes, you yeah. know me as a kid. You know me, or, we, or or if you look at, you look at a movie like Heat, and he tell you, you know, remember what's name told us back in the joint? Never get attached to anything. You can't walk out on thirty seconds flat if you feel the heat coming around the corner. Mm. And he told Robert De Niro that when he's sitting across the joint, he all, and, and Robert De Niro was a cop. Mm-hmm. I mean, Al Pacino was a cop, and he's mm-hmm. all and he all suited up, but he wasn't the one that was attractive. He he didn't have enough attraction around him in his role. He was just this cop that used to drink, couldn't get it right with his wife. You're not showing up, whatever. And you see Robert De Niro coming through smooth, got his life, no kids, spent a bunch of time in a joint. He dealing with the librarian girl. Mm. He just he come through the li- the library or the what, librarian, the the library, okay. whatever the whatever she was, the one that was in the library when he went into the bookstore. Oh, okay, no, okay. she was in the bookstore. He worked in the bookstore, I think. Okay, okay, okay. And you remember he go to get the book. Yeah, he meet her. And he went against he went against his whole rule in the end and why he get killed. But the whole thing is like you looking at this guy like this this fucking guy is the greatest guy in the world. Yeah, yeah. So so much of that is like it's what crazy. Your also your what your values are like what do yeah. you want to achieve in your life. Um, so much like you don't listen to that much rap these days that are like. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, something that's the opposite of ego. <laughs> you know, like yeah. you hear a lot of ego even in, in rap these days. Ego, ego, ego is life out here these days. Ego and um, right now, to a lot of people right now is God. Social media teach you right now and they worship right now. Mm-hmm. Meaning I need that shit right now. Yeah. Not tomorrow. And people don't look at your story. They look at your glory. They don't look at, you know, they did look at my page. I'm like, oh, Wallow winning right now. Wallow doing this at third. Is you going back to how many thousands and thousands of posts I had when I was living in any middle room and I showed you that? Mm. I never took nothing off my page and I do that. I, but mine's go all the way back to when I was in prison and I was posting in jail. Mm. I never took nothing off my page. So they gave you, they let, they let you use a phone? No, I had it illegally. Oh, okay. So, so, <laughs> I was going to say. So when you go back and you look at that, I showed you my journey. Nobody's going to look at that. They're yeah. looking at right now. Oh, shit. 
He went and look at that. And that's, and that's how life is now. It's about right now. So it's a big message of yours to young people that to have a different value system than the value system you had as a child. Oh man, you better have one because you can make it happen now. Mm-hmm. You could do you you could you could living right is man could take you to the moon these days. Because mm-hmm. you know you got to think about it. That's good. I could find somebody. Mm. I could come up with an idea right now. Yeah. I could find somebody overseas. Yeah. To develop the app or the technology for me. Mm-hmm. Pay them few thousand maybe once i get it go pitch it to some vcs mm. get the funding and be off to the races mm. i love it just think about that though and i can do it all on my phone i, I need to learn a little bit from you <laughs> man you got it i think you got it okay okay just gotta implement it just gotta implement yeah, you got it, it. Yeah. you know what you gotta do okay um so tell me so, uh, w- would you be upset if I called you Little Moo Moo? Yo, Little that's Moo-mo. wow. <laughs> How about if wild. I called you Little Moo Moo? Moo Moo. Moo Moo? Moo Moo, okay. That's wow, man. Would you be okay with that? That was my childhood nickname, That was your man. childhood nickname. I know, that's I know. That's crazy. Growing up in North Philly, right? North Philly? Moo Moo. Um, so, North Philly around that time, just get, can you just uh, like plan a, a visual of what North Philly was like in the 80s? North Philly was... Yes. Yeah. It was, it was fun. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you why. It was fun because outside of the poverty and all that, the ingenuity that we had to figure out ways to be happy, mm. wherever it was a block party, wherever it was going to somebody's basement, listen to some, some rap albums or, or wherever it was me listening to some dirty, some dirty uh, comedy albums with my uncle. It was, it's just, the physical fun was just, we our imagination back then and how we created so many things and that physical fun, mm. like being outside playing basketball in the crate, the milk crate. And uh, mm. it was just like, I mean, it was just different, man. Because it's like, we didn't have nothing, but we had everything because we had each other. That's the thing is like some of these other communities that maybe are more affluent don't have the community. You know, there's yeah. something special about that community that you had. And that you grew up, I, you grew up, uh, it was, you're poor. Would, would you say you're poor? Yeah, we wasn't rich. Yeah, you might as well say it. You know, you're trying to figure it out. And so you were out a lot. You were, you were out. I feel like you were out on the streets a lot, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And so what were you like in school? I wasn't that good at school. So at school, I would. I remember I was going to the school in the Logan section. And every time the teacher would get around to me to read or something, mm. i go to the bathroom. Mm. They get close because, you know, you read a paragraph, you read a paragraph. I'd be like, I got to use the bathroom. Shoot to the bathroom mm. and go utilize, use the bathroom. So it was always like, it was just different, you know. Yeah, yeah. What, uh, do you mind if I ask what uh, high school you went to? I went to high school. I went to... I ain't going to say I even went to Germantown like that. I went to high school, really, in jail. Mm. I was in prison already. Wow. That's right. Age 17. Yeah, I was in age. prison. Wow. Got my GED. That was age 17, though. But, you know, you did go through a lot of these different um, uh, situations um, where you put in. Like, why didn't you stop, like, after a certain number of being in the detention center? Like, what? Like, why didn't? Why do you think you just kept going even – after being put in detention centers. I never got punished. Mm, I see. All them juvenile facilities, they was like going to a school for boys that was like a college slash. They feed you good. You got all the sports in the you world. You got games. With it. Yeah. You got games and I shit. See. You're going home passes. Wasn't nothing. But there's a certain drive that you had then like you're not a fundamentally different person, but it seems like you channel a lot of it into good. Yeah, yeah. I had to. But you had talents then. Like mm-hmm. even though some of it was illegal, I mean, you still got away with a lot of stuff. Oh, without a doubt. Definitely yeah. did. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> you were a talented criminal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got away with that. There a must lot have been some that weren't as good as you. <laughs> yeah. Not trying to glamorize it, but I'm just saying. Yeah, there were talents. There's a, there was a skill set you had. Now, 
I'm so curious how you, you channel into what you do. I was talking to Troy Carr about this. Uh, one thing you're very, very good about, um, you're very good at marketing. I heard a story about that you were in Wawa, right? And you convinced everyone in Wawa um, to, buy, to buy your brand. So you could like on a dime, you know, bring it, like be really good at marketing. Anything, you know, I could do a little bit of anything. Yeah. You know, when it comes to marketing, because I believe in whatever I'm representing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to market it to, to the deaf. So when did you start getting interested in marketing? Uh, you know, I was in sale, right? Yeah. And I used to always watch commercials religiously. Yeah. To the point where I used to watch commercials and I said, that McDonald's, that sandwich, that Big Mac, that shit never looked like that anytime I got one. Mm-hmm. Then I realized, oh, well, who make, then I realized that the brands didn't make these commercials. It was an advertising agency. Mm-hmm. Started doing research on that. Then I ran across this book called Damn Good Advice by George Lois. Then I realized that George Lois was the guy they made this, the TV show, The Mad Men, about. Hmm. The ad. So I'm reading it. I'm like, oh, man. So I just, and I feel as though I was a marketer when I was writing on walls growing up. Hmm. Because people are like, oh, you wallow? Yeah, I'm wallow. Hmm. So it was like, I was like, this is my thing. Hmm. Cause I ain't got, you know, I ain't, I ain't. And then I was thinking about Crazy Eddie back in the day. You remember Crazy Eddie? Yes. That was my favorite dude on TV. I used to love yes, to see him. Yes, I remember Crazy. Yes. I am Crazy Eddie. Yes. And I was like. I, I haven't like, thought about Crazy Eddie since 84. <laughs> listen, Crazy Eddie was a marketing legend. Yes. Yes. You see what I'm saying? So I'm like, I'm sitting here. I'm like, that's the type of market. Like, I ain't got no problem. A lot of people is too cool to market their own product. They yeah. think they getting on people's nerves. Yeah. I realize now I'm going to keep it out there. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, there's got to be a continuity somewhere of skill set there from, you know, I don't know what it is. Do you know, do you know what it is? Like, what do you think is the core of your skill set? If you had to describe it? I believe my skill set is just going after it. Go getting it. Mm. I'm going to go get it. And I'm yeah. going to go get it. Great. Whatever I put my mind to, I'm going to go out there and get it. And especially if I believe in it. Um, yeah. I'm not waiting for nobody. Mm. Yeah, you there. I think you say in your book, you have this one, this realization that no one's going to save you. Ain't nobody coming to save yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I got to go get it. Let's talk about um, a topic I'm really interested in, which is a victim mindset, because I see it a lot in uh, the young people these days. Man, let me Do tell you. Do you see something. it too? Do you see it? They created this world, weirds, though. Judgment is lost in culture. Mm. Back in the day, if you did something, You were shamed. Mm. Shame was important. If you was a junkie, they'd say you were a junkie. Mm -hmm. If you was promiscuous, they'd call you a whore. Mm. If you was whatever, they would would put it on you and they'd shame you for it. Mm. So other people that's witnessing won't do the shit. Now, they got a way to where as though if you judge somebody, if you shame them, you're bullying them. So now this gave a, people a way a out to not be accountable in this culture of now. Mm-hmm. So what happened is you got a bunch of people running around here doing all this goofy shit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then and then if if you call them out about it, oh, you're you, 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 you're bullying me. And it, no. You just did some dumb shit. You just and I'm telling you that you did some dumb shit. And it's documented you did some dumb shit. Mm. And I told you about it. And now you're the victim and I'm the bad guy. Mm. This victim shit is unbelievable out here. It's rampant. Like in this this overly, it's like this, oh man. I don't even understand it. I don't like this. I, I, it's like you can't even, you can't even check nobody when they, they wrong. Mm. So, you know, I think that's going to weaken, weaken the universe. Well, you have the opposite mindset. Oh, no. If I do some dumb shit, I want you to tell me about it. Yeah. I call it an empowerment mindset. You know, like you want to be better, right? You want to learn. You want to grow. Um, but you also realize no one's going to come save you. Yeah. That's what made me get up and go hard every day. Mm. Yeah. So when you were actually in – how long were you in prison, by the way? 20. 20 years you were in prison. When you were in prison for 20 years, like – did you think to yourself, like, 
Actually, not only think of yourself, you wrote letters, right? Freedom letters. Letters of Freedom. I love that. Okay, tell us a little about those letters of freedom. Letters of Freedom was like a novella that I wrote. Yes. And you include examples of it in and your I book. And I was just writing yes. letters to freedom. Give us an example. Can you? Like I wrote, freedom was my girlfriend. Yeah. So I wrote letters to freedom about the advancement, how she changed, how she lived life different. Yeah. How she more spinner, experimental and just doing her. And and I was like basically telling her like, I miss you. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can't wait to ex- you know experience all the things you learned since I've been gone. Yeah. And when I'm talking about the experience and things you learned since I was born, I was talking about the growth in women out here. Mm. Like how they, you know, how they, you know, it, and it was like, I used to just write letters to her. I mean, when you walked out um, uh, as a, as a f- uh, pretty much free man, right? Um, eventually in 2017, uh, you were aware of that the, the odds were stacked against you. You were aware of the recidivism rate and you that in a way that kind of motivated you, right? You're like, I'm yeah. not going to, I'm going to defy the odds. Yeah. I'm going I'm to just, I'm going to, I'm going to do it up for real. Yeah. You know, and I just went at it every day. Yeah. And did you think about that a lot in prison about how like when I get out of here, I'm going to just, I'm not coming back. Yeah. 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 I know it's more for me out there and that's what I really tapped into. Yeah. Well, talk about some of the things that you're up to these days. Cause I know you, you have your hands in a lot of things. Um, you know, first and foremost, you got on with good intentions. A book. Yes. The memoir. You got uh, Airplanes or Hotel, my clothing line. Yeah. You got Wallow 267 Foundation, which is my foundation to show support um, and create resources for juvenile people that's in the juvenile system coming home. Because, you know, I think about the resources that I ain't have and things that could have prevented me from going, keep elevating the crime. Um, You got Pure Few, my hydration drink right there. Is this yours? Yeah, fish. fish, Yeah, go ahead. Do your thing. Fish who drink at a fish who are recent drink at Philadelphia seventy sixes in Chicago sky. Wow! Uh, so you know, I'm just doing a lot of different things, man. You know. Do you work with Meek Mills? Yeah. Refor- so tell me about Reform Alliance. Uh, Reform Alliance is something that Meek hooked me up with. Uh, and Mike Rubin bring me over there. Did my thing, you know, over there. You know. And Jay Z is part of that too, right? Yeah. So, so you advocate for criminal justice reform. Yeah, so, what's tell me something's wrong with the system right now? No, it's just a pro, you know probation, parole. People is getting these lengthy sentences after the time, you know. And there's a lot of violations. People getting violations got to go back up top. Yeah. You know, me because of them. So, you know, it's just a lot. You know, mm-hmm. other things I'm working on. Like, mm-hmm. it's just you know, I, sometimes I don't even talk about the things that ain't materialized yet. Mm-hmm. I just like to focus on. You know, what you can see, what you can feel, what you can touch, what you can get mm. right now. And, then you know, I, I just keep developing other things uh, until I make it pop, until I get my proof of concept. I just really. That's fine. But then YouTube Avenues, what is that? Yes, I'm a cultural advisor at YouTube. Okay. I created a, pers- a pro- program called YouTube Avenues, where as though we go to cities, in the cities of America, okay. put four or 500 people in a room and educate them on how to start their YouTube, how to scale on YouTube, how to monetize their YouTube. Wow. Do you, is that just with working with young people or do you do that? No, that's with whoever. You can come. Anybody can come. Can I come? Yeah, you can. We come into New York City. I'll make sure you get an invite. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm dead serious. Well, I, I'm dead serious in saying thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be incredible. Um, just something, you know, you're big in the in the hip-hop community. Um, watch the podcast. Love the episode of 50. 50 Cent. Um, and, you know, there's something interesting about you because, like, I'm sitting next to you and like, I see, you know, I see a little bit of this tough exterior, but I also see this vulnerability. Yeah. And, uh, and you put a lot of that in this book, but I don't feel like on the whole, the hip hop community embraces vulnerability. I feel like it embraces like the, the tough exterior a bit more. So like, what do you, like, what do you say to your fellow colleagues in the hip hop community and, in, in, in trying to like make a call f- to have this more expansive view of like, I think yeah. the best thing I could do is just be myself and lead by example. Yeah. Um, and I, cause I'm always going to be open up yeah. to what I'm experiencing, what I'm going through, what I'm feeling. And I think sometimes people going, it, it got to be in you. Mm. You know, if it ain't in you, it ain't in you. It got to be who you are. Yeah. And I just be me. So hopefully they, you know, those that's, that, that's, that's who they am. It's going to show. Yeah. Cause there is a lot of vulnerability in a sense, like a lot of, 
rappers talk about where they came from, right? So that's mm-hmm. for sure. But is there a lot of vulnerability in terms of like, like I feel insecure, you know? Like it, there's so much ego. I think nobody want to say that, but I think right. we all, we, as humans, we all have insecurities. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I just think it's about. I remember when I was in prison, right? Mm. And I realized that I was going bald. I was like, shit. I was really, I was real insecure about that. When you were going what? Sandy? Bald. Oh, bald. Gotcha. Gotcha. I was like, damn. Shit, I'm getting old, you know? Mm. And I started going bald when I was like 27. So I don't know oh, if it wow. was like. It means you have high testosterone. Yeah, I don't know if it was the stress. I didn't know what the fuck was going on. Testosterone. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, shit. Yeah. Yeah. But just even just talking about like feeling insecure, feeling like that's angry. Human. That's, yeah. 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 Oh, that's I mean, I feel like those messages need to be a little bit like be celebrated a little bit more in the hip hop mm-hmm. community, you know? Yeah, I understand. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so who are some other big influences in your life? I, 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 well, first of all, I love your book and I enjoyed reading just even like just different people in your life that you really admired, right? Like um, your older sibling, Stevie. Tell me that about Stevie. My God, that's my brother. Rest I in know. peace. He was just that guy to me, man. Mm. I just sit there on the bed and watch him get dressed, mm. listen to the music. Like he introduced me to hip hop because mm. he had, you know, I'm looking at them cassettes over there. So just imagine <laughs> all them slots fill times two. Mm. That's how many tapes he had, right? Because we was cassette tape warriors back then, and I used to be in there with him, getting dressed, I'm listening to different tapes. I'm making my own mixtapes, especially when the double cassette came out where you could record. Yeah. I was like, you played the one song, off, pause it, put the other tape in there. Like, no, that was my guy, man. You know, he was just, he was that, he, he knew how to move, hmm. you know. So who there were others that were big influences on you, right? Anyone yeah. else you want to shout out to right now? Man, it was many, you know, but Steve was the one that was really, really that. Hmm. So another big message you talk about, well, and by, by the way, yeah, the one who uh, wrote your forward, Mama Yanla. Yana Van Zandt. She says she's so proud of you, right? Yes. Yeah, yes, that must feel good. That felt extraordinary being as though when I was in prison, I used to have our book called the, we used to call it the Purple Books, Acts of Faith. It was this purple book, right? Mm-hmm. Small, put in your pocket, give you a little daily inspirations. Mm-hmm. So for me to connect with her, I remember when the first time she DM'd me out of nowhere, I almost dropped the phone. I was like, shit. And I told her, like, yo. Wow. And then for us to connect, I went to her home, had a great meal. Yeah. Uh, and she just showed me so much love. Beautiful. You have a lot of people that, that, that support you right now. Yes, that's a blessing. I feel like there's a lot of, you give love, and I feel a lot of love get, comes back to you. Yeah. yeah a lot. Of, oh, another big part of your message is about seeking, where to seek your validation. Right? Do you seek it externally? Do you seek it through money, women, and um, cars, or internally? And your big part of your message is internally, right? You better. Or what? You know what I mean? You're in trouble. It kind of leads you down a different path. Yeah, that's where it's at, man. You gotta you gotta tap in the tap in within. Yeah, that's what it's about. Yeah, and you do that every day. Every day, I'm on a mission. Mm. Tell me more about your mission. You know, my mission is to help people. Mm. give people the help that I wanted when I was down. Everybody wants somebody to help them, but they don't help nobody. Mm. Think about this shit. Oh, help me. Who did, who did you help? Who did you do something for? Mm. Everybody quick to play the victim. Ain't nobody helping me. Ain't nobody supporting me. Ain't nobody. Who did you help and support? Mm. You know, everybody's just takers out here. So it's just deep. Mm. But I just try to lead by example, help people in real time. Yeah. And you teach, you teach this message that, the more you give, the more you actually get in return. It's better, you know, in a lot of ways. I mean, a lot mm-hmm. of people might think the only avenue to receiving things in life is by taking. And that's you're not, like, no. You're not going to get what you truly want by doing that. You got to mm-hmm. work for this shit. Mm-hmm. And you got to work smart, not hard. Mm-hmm. Love it. And you got to figure out your thing. Mm-hmm. You do a lot of grit. Um, and I think a big part of the message here of your life is how you've channeled it's not like you've you've just completely transformed, but you've you've channeled. I'm gonna um, we could end the interview now, and I'll end with a quote, um, which I think really summarizes a lot of this. You were thinking this February 18th, 2017. If I could transfer the hustler's energy that I brought to robbing, stealing, and dealing to motivating people to give 100 percent to reaching their highest potential while staying out of trouble, I thought to myself, 
can't nobody fuck with me. Nope. And they My can't. man. And they can't.